um, it's probably unusual to begin a course with a dedication, but I am doing this as an act of pietas for my four modules in this brief course. Father Schumacher was my teacher at the Ateneo in 1972. He taught a graduate course on Philippine history that I, a college senior at that time, attended when undergraduates were still allowed to enroll in graduate courses. His thoroughness and rigor and comprehensiveness as a historian confirmed me in my decision to enter the field of history. This is my choice of epigraph, not only for my modules, but for the entire Philippine church history course. Such courses can easily become triumphalistic. But if you know your history, you would see the history of the Philippine church rather as a source of wonder. You could find yourself asking, how was it possible that the Philippine church is still here? that Catholicism is the religion of around 85% of the, of the population. So, well, this first session is a combination of the first two chapters of Schumacher's textbook on Philippine church history. Mm -hmm. There you have the chapter titles. So as you can see, chapter two is the actual beginning of the story of Christianity in the Philippines and chapter one, the information we need to know why the Philippine church developed the way it did. Um, let me say that the preparation of my modules using Schumacher's readings in Philippine church history has cemented the conviction in my mind that his textbook is peerless and therefore hollering for a replacement after all, it was written in 1979. Uh, there is a second edition, which I think is dated um, 2010. But as Father Schumacher himself told me, there's very little that I've changed in the original text. So 79, well, that's 42 years ago. And the first one who would have revised his text would probably have been Father Schumacher himself, because we have that collection of essays of his on Philippine church history published in 2009 as growth and decline, and it makes important revisions to his 1979 textbook. Now, I'm not going to use Schumacher's book slavishly, uh, although I do recommend that if you have a copy of that book, to read the chapter that I am going to be featuring. Uh, there are many copies of the second edition available at Loyola House of Studies. I guess you just have to get in touch with them to find out how you can purchase a volume. Um, so I don't think um, reading Schumacher slavishly would have pleased uh, Father Jack. Uh, at all. So I will dialogue with them and when needed, correct or supplement them. Let's begin with the first part. I am following the, the section headings in Father Schumacher's book. This is the first the Spanish church in the Indies. And I've picked out this statement, the history of Christianity in the Philippines can scarcely be understood without speaking first of the great movement, political and religious, of renovation and new life in the mother country and of Spain's empire in the Indies. I think we all know what he's referring to. The immediate antecedent of the, the date that we are, we are going to be celebrating in March is the expulsion of the Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula, and then that burst of geographical uh, exploration that led Magellan to our shores. Uh -huh. I am not going to spend more time on that. That's a very I agree completely with it, 
but as you can see by quickly reading this sentence, it, it's a very complicated thing to prove. Okay, here are the four points that I want to go through in which Father Schumacher features. The Patronat, Patronato Real de las Indias, the famous demarcation line, which I think we're all familiar with. Bartolome de las Casas and Francisco de Vitoria that many Filipinos are not familiar with, unfortunately, but whose ideas are so important to understand the history of Christianity in the Philippines. And finally, Las Leyes de las Indias, which does not appear in Father Schumacher's textbook, nor in his collection of essays, but which in my opinion is very important, again, to understand Legaspi and the soldiers and the friars that came with him in 1565. Unfortunately, this topic is not available in many books in English. I think, in fact, it's available only in one or two, which is impossible for me to access in the present circumstances that we have. And so I have had to content myself with a summary in Wikipedia. But it's not too bad. Okay, another section, the age of discovery, right? That's the first section here. The demarcation line. Three points. For Portugal had endeavored to legitimate her conquests by appealing to the popes of the 15th century for papal bulls giving her the exclusive right to the territories her seamen were discovering. And then the Spanish king, Fernando el Católico, does the same thing in 1492. And Alexander VI comes out with the demarcation line in 1493 in his bull Inter Cetera. Uh, so it's there really to, as a gesture of peacemaking between Portugal and Spain. And I'm going to go quickly over this topic. Uh, I hope you don't mind through pictures. So here's the first, this is a map done in 1502. And you can see um, the Philippines should be there on the right, but it doesn't appear because Magellan has not, from the European point of view, discovered it. But there on the left, there's a blue line and that's the demarcation line, okay? All the territory to the right of it is Portuguese. We're talking of their discoveries. And all the territories discovered to the left of it would be Spanish. Right? Well, here's another look at it. Okay. The dotted line corresponds to the line that was first drawn by the Pope, Alexander VI. And then a treaty followed uh, soon after, which we know as the Treaty of Tordesillas, which moved the line further to the west. Okay. Now, the continuation of it on the other side of the world is there on the right in green. And as you can see, it doesn't cover the Philippines. The Philippines falls in Portuguese territory. But that green line was drawn far in the future. In other words, today. And during the time of Magellan of Legaspi, just exactly where it passed on the other side of the globe was something that was debated. But by the 1580s, Portugal and Spain were united in one kingdom. And so the discussion of where it passed became moot and academic. Here is a third map showing the same thing. Uh, Portuguese hemisphere, Spanish hemisphere. I have it here because of the Latin clause above, Mare Clausum. 
and you've got a, an explanation here. A, a sea under the jurisdiction of a single nation and not open to all others, right? That, that's actually what it means. Of course, when it was first drawn, it had Spain and Portugal in mind because you can be sure when the Dutch came along, when the British came along, uh, centuries later, when the French came along, they didn't bother with that uh, demarcation line. But this is an important concept. Nobody else allowed in our territory because that's a way to understand uh, the Spanish presence in the Philippine Islands. Spain did not establish governments from north to south of the Philippines. But the Philippines was simply known to the rest of the world as Spanish territory. And hindi ba colony siya ng Spain? Alam mo, there are two concepts of colony. One is the concept which the Bourbons came and established at the beginning of the 18th century and which we are more familiar with. It's a concept of colony which was uh, attacked by Marx. And the concept of colony before that, which goes way back to the Greeks and, and the Romans. No? And, and that's the time we belong to the old concept of, of colony. It followed the Mare Clausum uh, pattern. Okay. All right, this is a map made in 1550. Well, there you have the Philippines on the right, but you don't see Luzon because Luzon had not yet been discovered by Legaspi. Right? So, um, okay, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to invite you to take a look at another perspective in which to see the history of the Philippine church. Uh, we've been looking at the perspective of the Spaniards, right? But really, the history of the church in the Philippines forms part of the history of the church period. And here you have the first phase of the history of the church. When Christianity basically covered the Mediterranean nations, followed by Christianity moving towards Europe. And here you can see that it now included the Slavs, that's Russia, Eastern Europe, and Scandinavia to the north. And that's all that Christianity covered up to the time of the Portuguese and Spanish explorations. And then this happens. Christianity through Spain and Portugal just spills over to the rest of the world. North America and South America, Asia, not yet in Africa. But I'm not going to cover that because we're really focused on the Philippine church. But you can see the arrows going to, to India and to the Moluccas and to Macau and Japan. And yes, the Philippines is there. We belong to Act 3. Mm -hmm. Africa will be in Act 4. Okay. What's the importance of these maps? Well, if Christians do not know that you exist, they will not think of evangelizing you. Okay. This is a point made obliquely by by Nick Joaquin in his book on culture and essay in culture and history, because he says the Asians knew about us. You can see it from the posh cards of pottery that have been excavated from Luzon down to Mindanao. But they did not 
proselytize with us. The exception would be um, the Muslims. Okay. But before that, centuries passed between the first Asian contact and the first Muslim contact. And there was no attempt at bringing Hinduism or Buddhism or Confucianism to the Philippines. Okay. Here you have a map dated 1570. It's a Dutch map. Wala pa dyan ang Pilipinas. A Luzon, I mean. Okay. With the discovery of Luzon comes also the Christianization of the Philippines. And I'm looking at my watch, which is here on the table to my left. And I've seen, I've been talking too much. All right. This is a problem. I've got to be frank with you. When we began planning out this course, we were at first thinking of Saturdays with six hours devoted to, to the course. Afterwards, we chopped it down to three hours. And then now, during COVID times, we have been warned beyond an hour, everybody gets Zoom fatigue. Uh, so we brought it down to two hours. And here I am trying to Squeeze every all this material. No, Balana. Let us see. Okay, next section: the papal bulls. Well, there's an interesting photograph which you can find on Google because it's a photograph of Alexander the Sixth in Tercetera, which talks about the demarcation line. The text is in Latin, but on top. The text is in Spanish, so this is a copy. Uh, it is doubtful if Alexander foresaw the far-reaching conclusions which would be drawn from his bowl of arbitration between Spain and Portugal. Okay, Schumacher is referring to the Patronato Real, which we will see in a little short while. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a quotation. As you know, Schumacher's textbook is a collection of readings. So for the most part, I'm going to feature just those readings. Very rarely, I will feature Schumacher himself. Pero iba talaga, when you read a translation of the words of the primary sources. You proposed with a divine blessing to take control over these mainlands and efforts said islands and to, and to bring the natives to the Catholic faith. And then the Pope gives permission. We assign to you all islands and mainlands discovered yet to be discovered, et cetera, et cetera. No? But the first paragraph is important uh, because part of our subject matter this morning is the gulu, which came in the 16th century. There were all these islands and mainlands, if they were not actually possessed by another king or Christian prince by the day on Christmas Day, in 1493, uh, when some of the aforesaid islands were discovered by your representatives, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. so we grant by the authority of them granted to us, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We by these presents do donate, grant, and assign, and with them and all their possessions, for towns, forts, territories, cities, and all the rights and jurisdictions appertaining thereto, to you and your heirs and successors the kings of Castile and Leon forever. And we, the descendants of those who were immediately uh, affected by this portion of the interchet that I can ask, what right did the Pope have to do this? Okay, I'm not going to comment on that because we're going to take a look at the controversy on that uh, in a short while. Right? But what's important if you keep in mind our perspective, is the indirect message. None of you other European nations can go over to the Philippines to evangelize them or colonize them. That's the message behind Intercetera. And we may constitute and depute you and your heirs and successor lords of the same with full free and all-embracing power 
authority and jurisdiction. Moreover, we order you to dispatch the designated mainlands and islands, virtuous and God-fearing men. So, Bisari magpadala kayo doon ng tao. Huh? Endowed with learning, experience, and skill to instruct the natives and inhabitants in the Catholic faith and to, inst- and to instill in them sound more. Wala siyang sinasabi about ruling. That would be the controversial point. Okay? It's pure evangelization that's being talked about here. Right. So, an immediate effect of this is a so-called Patronato Real de las Indias, Indias, no? which literally means the royal patronage of the Indies. No? And how do we understand patronage? Na ang patron na mga Kristiyanong Pilipino ay ang mga Haring Kastila. I'm not going to translate patron because it has all sorts of connotations in Tagalog, and that's what is meant. Okay. A technical definition from uh, the textbook of Father Schumacher. The royal patronage by which the king financed the church in the Indies and as patron had the right to present candidates and thus in effect to appoint to all ecclesiastical positions in the church in the Indies, right? So Malinao, the church, the king finances the church in the Philippines. And in return, they have the right to present candidates. And as, as, the, as the glossary in Schumacher says, and thus in effect to appoint. To appoint whom? Bishops. Parish priests. Uh, that's absolutely anomalous <laughs> today. And it has always been understood by the church as a concession. So it's still the church that has to approve it, but only from a list prepared by the Spanish king, usually with just three candidates. Okay, some quotations from papal bulls talking about that. Now, since you will be burdened with heavy expenses to recover these islands and regions, etc., it is proper that you be allowed to demand and levy tithes from the natives and inhabitants now living there for the conservation and retention of the said islands once they are acquired and recovered, etc., etc. Importante po. Because this has a direct effect on the so-called tributo collected by the Spanish crown from the Filipino Christians. Uh, again, I'm not going to spend time on this because it will be the topic of our session next week. This is granted on condition that according to the ordination of the bishops then in the localities, whose conscience we burden in this matter, an endowment first be assigned, uh, real in effect, etc. So, nakanung ba na endowment na ganon? I, in the very beginning, the, the documents of the Synod of Manila talk about a caja, a treasury. No? But later on, I don't think there was a formal endowment. Simply, the crown was behind it. And crown meant to say that sometimes the money might come from, not from Madrid, but from Mexico. Hmm? Okay, basically it meant that the crown was the one who built churches, was the one who bought bread, wheat bread, wine, uh, church vestments, church vessels, this was all the expense of the government, not the expense of the people who were Christianized, were evangelized. And all the living expenses of the missionaries. Wala tayong binabanggit dito tungkol sa encomendero. 
All right? Keep that in mind, please. Because that's going to surface next week. Okay, another papal bull, but this time from Julius II. Uh, please attend, pay attention to the dates. In the islands and regions of the sea were by, etc., etc. No, you can read it very fast. The important part is the next slide. We grant the right of patronage and the right to present suitable for the churches. Okay, these are places in, I, I believe, in Mexico. But of course, it was extended to the Philippines. Right? And. Okay, presentation of these is to be made according to the canons to us and our. Okay, it's talking about candidates to positions there in the different pueblos. Okay, so Julius II is the one who is more explicit about so called Spanish rights. No? And here you have a cedula, which means a decree, right? not just the cedula as we understand it today. Mm -hmm. From Philip II, uh, that's 1574. So the long town na si Legaspi sa Manila. He says, and, and what he says here is simply, he asserts his right, sole right of patronage in the Indies and forever reserved to us. You know? And let no secular person nor cleric order, convent, congregation, or community, whatever state, blah, 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 okay, dare to intrude into matters touching this patronage, nor prejudice us in this subject, in our viceroy's audience, and how to proceed with the break against them. But you notice that it's no longer European nations that are being addressed by Philip II. He's addressing this to the religious orders. And we're going to see that in, a, in later sessions of this course, um, not under me, the first time the top, topic comes up, but the third time you will see me, we'll talk about it, right? I will be tackling the the sorry climax of that controversy between the religious orders and the Spanish government. And please, so sinasabi ko po ba na magka-away, magkalaban yung dalawa? Yes. <laughs> because we have this impression drawn from, I guess from the Anoli and the Fili, that the Spanish government was the puppet of the, the friars or the reverse, that the friars were the puppets of the Spanish government. Uh, but at this stage in time, 1574, you already have Philip II anticipating a way between the religious orders and the Spanish government. You know? I think you will notice that many times the real history of the church in the Philippines is very unlike the popular history that we're all familiar with. Okay, justice to the Indians. This is a nice topic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the pictures are eloquent. These are prints made more or less during this time the 16th century, the first half of the 16th century, and all of these people who are being uh, tortured and so on, they're supposed to be American Indians. So the reference of the prints, probably made by enemies of Spain, which would be the British and the Dutch. No? Uh, they refer to the Spanish conquest of the Antilles, the Caribbean, of Mexico and of Peru, which as we know, was attended by enormous cruelties and the almost total destruction of the Indian population of the Antilles or the Caribbean. And here is where Bartolome de las Casas comes in. 
That's a monument in South America to him. Uh, so this is a, an excerpt from a writing by Bartolome de las Casas. Let's go a little bit slowly through it. This term or name, conquest, with regard to all the lands of the Indies already discovered or to be discovered in the future. So, kailan ito sinulat? So, mga 1520s siguro yan. No? Uh, I say siguro because uh, it passed through several editions. Is a word or term which is tyrannical, Mahometan, politically incorrect, abusive, improper, and infernal. Um, this is a Dominican friar criticizing the government. But in all the Indies, there is no question of conquests against Moors of Africa or Turks or heretics who hold our lands, persecute Christians, and work to destroy our holy faith. But rather, ang pinag-uusapan natin ang nangyayari sa Americas and Caribbean, preaching of the gospel of Christ, spreading of the Christian religion, and conversion of souls. For this, what is necessary is not conquest by arms, but persuasion with sweet and divine words and the examples and works of a holy life. This affair is not to be called conquest, but preaching of the faith and conversion and salvation of those infidels who are ready without delay to receive Jesus Christ as universal creator, etc., etc. And I hope you're thinking, ha, ah, praile bang sumulat nito? And he is opposing Spanish conquests of the Americas? And the answer is yes. And for more quick answers, please use Google. I actually don't have to tell that to my students in UANP, but I think there are people in the audience who are my generation, hindi tayo sanay. So for quick facts, Google your cell phone. Right, this is again from uh, Bartolome de las Casas. The title which the kings of Castile held to the universal and supreme, but not to the particular, ah, importante, lordship of the world of the Indies was no other than the preaching of the gospel and the conversion of these people. So, yes, they are opposing Spanish rule in the Americas and saying, Uy, ah, yung permiso ninyo from the Pope is only to preach the gospel and convert people. What are you doing ruling them? Only for this reason could the Roman church intervene in granting them that universal and sovereign and imperial lordship without prejudice, however, to the natural kings and lords of the Indies and without detriment to the liberty of their peoples. So that, that last part means to say the Spaniards did, had no right to depose Natural kings and lords. Uh, what's going on here? Well, I should say that when when Bartolomé de las Casas wrote these words, uh, the Spanish conquest of the Americas was over. I mean, they were already ruling there. Of course, they had not reached the Philippines. So, you know, the... Um, Implementation of this would be in the Philippines. The text that you're reading here. Okay, we're going to see that hopefully in the second part of our session this morning. Oh dear, I think I'm really running out of time. With the preaching of the gospel in the introduction of the faith deprives neither the kings of their kingdom nor individuals of their liberties, lands, and property, but rather confirms them in these rights. Liberties, lands, and property. Eh, hindi naman yan ang nangyari sa atin sa Pilipinas, hindi ba? Ah, surprise.
Francisco de Vitoria, another Dominican. So what's his claim to fame? This guy was a fan, a big fan of Bartolomé de las Casas. And Bartolomé de las Casas was not interested in coming out with theological treatises or philosophical tracts. He wrote polemical stuff addressed to the Spanish rulers. So what Francisco de Vitoria did was to reduce what Bartolomé de las Casas wrote to theology. And because of that, he has a hall named for him in the UN. And he has a reputation of being the father of international law. Uh, that's, that's the picture, blurred picture that you see on the right that comes from the New York headquarters of the UN. Mm -hmm. So this is from Vittoria's treatise. The Pope is not the civil, civil or temporal Lord of the whole world, speaking of dominion and civil power in a proper sense. Even if the Pope had such secular power in the whole world, he could not transmit it to secular rulers. Mm -hmm. So what's happening then with inter cetera? Third, the Pope does have temporal power as referred to spiritual matters, that is to the extent it is necessary in order to administer spiritual matters. And so this refers to buildings like churches, objects like um, church furniture, vestments, vessels, uh, and the Eucharistic species. The Pope has no temporal power over those barbarians nor over other pagans. So this, this word barbarian, please don't read it as insult. It's a technical term hmm? taken from the Greeks, okay? um, which simply means people who did not share in the Greco-Roman Christian civilization. This corollary follows from what has been said. Even if the barbarians should not be willing to recognize any dominion in the Pope, one cannot, for that reason, make war on them nor seize their goods. This is evident because such dominion does not exist. So it's what we read from Bartolomé de las Casas, but now it's in the form of a theological treatise. Okay, now we come to the part which. I <laughs> inserted the new laws of the Indies. No? Uh, this is actually an, in Spanish, Nuevas Leyes de las Indias, because there were Leyes de las Indias, which were written before this. This would come around the 15, uh, 50s, I mean, several of them, no? right? And the old laws of the Indies, they go back to the 1540s. They were the result of debates in the Spanish court between Bartolomé de las Casas and the people who agreed with him and the Spanish jurists, like this fellow, who did not quite agree with Bartolomé de las Casas, Juan de Solorzano, right? He participated in the debates about the rights of Spain in the Indies, derived from the bulls of Pope Alexander VI. And his work in the 1620s was the basis for the so-called Recopilación de las Leyes de las Indias. Okay, so these are now laws of the Indies, which ito yung sinabi ko sa inyo, ma Matatagpuan po ninyo sa Wikipedia, 1542. Governors had an obligation to take care of the well-being and preserve Native Americans, referred to as Indians by the law. Alagaan. Itong governors, governor generals, huh? that there was no motive to enslave them in the future 
not by war, nor due to rebellion, nor to ask for a rescue, nor for any reason or in any way. I have been confronted by people saying that the Spaniards came here and enslaved Filipinos. Pwede ba? Pwede ba? Okay, there was forced labor. Um, and we're referring above all to the attacks that the Dutch were making to us. It's a specific period in Philippine history. But it doesn't mean na ginawa silang alipin because alipin in the Philippines at that time when the Spaniards were aware of native vocabulary was a sociological status, a social status. And slavery here is also referring to a social status. That Native Americans currently enslaved must be freed immediately unless the owner could prove in Spain, which implied traveling back there, the full juridical legitimacy of such a state. Uh, nangyari din ito sa Pilipinas. So, makikita natin yan next week. That the bad habit of making Native Americans work on tamemes, uh, that's not a Tagalog term, please, against their will or without fair payment, must be ended immediately. So tameme was an Indian term for Indians who were forced to work. Manual labor for free. E sa Pilipinas, ganyan din ba? E ganyan din po? Ala. That they must not be taken to remote regions to fish for pearls. Uh, the counterpart of this in the Philippines was forcing Pinoy's to row, let's say from the Luzon all the way to the Visayas of Mindanao. Uh, so that's pang next week, Puyan. That only the Viceroy had the right to establish encomiendas on Native Americans, the prohibition to establish encomiendas included all religious orders, hospitals, communalities, and civil servants. So, may pagbabawal? Yes. Yes. Okay. That the distribution of people and lands given to the original conquerors as a feudal lordship of sorts should stop immediately after their death. And both land and the native people would become subject to the crown. So itong distribution na ito na pinag-uusapan dito is the, the encomienda. This is the encomienda. And so after a certain time, no wala na sila. Roughly by the 1650s, wala na mga encomiendas. And you still have people who don't know Philippine history talking about encomenderos in the 18th century, 19th century. Well, 